Um, you know, but but at the same time, uh, you kind of got to judge a person uh, by their own uh, yardstick in a certain way, or at least uh, that's that's something that you you can incorporate into your into your view of them. And and I think that's that's something that I kind of ended up doing after after talking to her. One of the most humanizing things for me was the great detail you included when you and your producer went to her horse farm to interview her. She offered you both sandwiches. Oh yeah, she didn't. Just, she didn't just offer. She made. She she made us sandwiches. Yeah, it, we 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 took her up on it. <laughs> okay, so I have to ask, what kind of sandwiches were they? Um, <laughs> were they good sandwiches? What kind of small talk did you make while you were eating the sandwiches? Uh, I don't actually remember what kind of sandwiches they were. Um, I think like basic cold cold cut situation. Um, I don't know. She was really super generous. You know, we we she wanted us to be uh, comfortable and. She wanted us to feel at home. Uh, it was it was very sweet. Um, you know, as far as the small talk, I think we I think the small talk uh, mostly happened like the day before, the two days earlier when I was just alone with her and we were just talking. And I think you know I told her about myself quite a bit and told her about my you know where I come from and what my career has been up to this point and you know talked about uh, my family and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, just kind of regular get, get get to know you stuff. Did you? find anything in common well one thing was that i for some reason was really struck by the fact that she speaks german with her husband at home um i think it can and then i i kind of it kind of contributed to my sense of her being up kind of apart from the world like she sort of retreated from the world a little bit um by virtue of living you know in this rural area by virtue of not really giving a lot of interviews and sort of by having this hermetically sealed uh small uh, world in which she she spoke a language you know that uh, her neighbors didn't necessarily speak. Um, the reason I bring that up in response to your question is that I I grew up uh, speaking Russian at home, and so we we sort of bond, bonded over that. <laughs> your parents are Russian. Yeah, I was actually I was actually born there myself, uh, and we moved over when I when I was five years old. Which part of Russia? Moscow. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> So you were actually, you grew up behind what we would have called the Iron Curtain. That's right. I was born in uh, in 85. <laughs> How did that change your impression of the U.S. and covering our politics? Well, I mean, you can't, I can't say how did it change because you only know yeah. <laughs> your perspective. But how did it inform well, your perspective? I don't know. I think, you know, I think part of, um, I think what, there's, a, there's sort of a stereotype about, about Russian immigrants in America that they are often very conservative, um, and that's because I think they saw the horrors of you know a leftist uh, communist society. Um, you know, my mother uh, is is a you know she as I said before, like my parents were Clinton supporters, and um, my mom, you know, was very much a votes, votes Democratic. Um, but I think she probably instilled in me like some skepticism towards. Uh, sort of leftist ideas, I guess, that I've, that I've been processing, uh, since, since childhood. I don't know how that, uh, exactly affected, has affected my, like, read on American politics, but, um, every once in a while I'll catch myself sort of having, like, a, a reaction to, to something, um, that I can trace back to sort of her sort of ingrained distrust of, of, uh, of socialism. In the first season, I don't feel like you cut Nixon any breaks, and in this season, I don't feel like you've cut Clinton any breaks. I think you've been a fair dealer, um, applying the same rigor to both sides thanks yeah i mean with <clears throat> excuse me with with uh with with nixon it was it was uh, a little bit different than with clinton because there aren't a lot of nixon apologists out there anymore right there's not like there's not like a, a movement to rehabilitate his image particularly uh, i think there was for a while you know and we when we did when we, when we did a live show uh at the end of last season we we, we kind of wrote a, a story that we performed live about Nixon's own efforts to kind of rehabilitate his reputation, kind of in, to emerge as a, as a, as a statesman um, in the wake of Watergate. But by the time we got to it, more than 40, 40 years after the fact, uh, I didn't find, I didn't feel particularly compelled to dwell on like his foreign policy victories or whatever, or, like because Watergate just overshadows it so much. And I, there's not a lot of people who I think would argue with that. With Clinton, you know, I think it's more complicated because, you know, not only was the country extremely prosperous under his administration, but he was genuinely popular. He was, he was someone people loved. You can't just kind of disapprove of that. You know, that's not a point of view that you can start with and make a show that, uh, 
kind of genuinely explores the past. I feel like our, our, our MO with the show is to try to understand where everyone was coming from, right? So that means try to understand where the Christian right was coming from when they uh, denounced him. It means trying to understand where Linda Tripp was coming from when she made you know the choices that she made. Um, and it means trying to understand where Clinton was coming from. Uh, you know, and, and I mentioned uh, the upcoming episode earlier about uh, how feminists and, and liberals re- responded to the, to the scandal. Um, I think one aspect of that was that he was humanized uh, by, by this whole ordeal. I think people saw in him, you know, a person being pursued by uh, law enforcement by law enforcement in a way like someone who uh, was being hunted and, and and they imagine themselves being hunted in the same way or imagine themselves having to kind of be naked in front of the the whole world in the way that he was when he for instance gave his grand jury testimony um, you know a video of which was was released to the public and so people watched that and people people felt for him I think um, and so that's you know that's 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 just true it's uh, it's not something that we that I think it's not something that we felt like we can we can pronounce whether they those people were wrong or right. I think the the, the object of the show is to try to re- retrace you know the logic and the emotional logic of of how people ended up there. And you can really only do that by talking to both sides, even people who've been portrayed as cartoonishly villainish. Did I say villainish right? Car- car- <laughs> car- cartoon cartoon villains. Um, do you think that coming at this sort of from the outside, um, you know, the way that Tom Tom Wolf used to say that wearing the white suit everywhere he went made him a bit of an alien. People just didn't know what to make of this guy, and so they would explain everything to him like a complete outsider. Do you think that you were able to play an outsider card at all and just say, "Look, I don't come from generations of being Democrats or generations of being Republican"? Yeah, I think I I think I was not necessarily because of like my Russian background, but because of my age. Like I, I was able to sincerely tell someone like Linda Tripp, like, look, I, I, I am conscious of the, of the sort of intuitions I inherited and I am currently trying to, you know, pressure test them and reassess them. And, uh, I sincerely don't know the story. I sincerely don't know the details. And so, um, I think that helped kind of, uh, I think that encouraged, you know, certain people I talked to, including Linda Tripp to, feel like I, I was there to um, learn something, you know, and to try to, to try to understand something that I went into an interview not understanding. Um, so, yeah, I think I, 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 I certainly tried to emphasize the extent to which I was coming to the story with a with a blank slate or with as with as blank a slate as possible. I'm a huge fan of reporting where I can't tell what the reporter thinks, um, where there's a lot of information <laughs> there, but I really can't. I, I really can't discern your political views and what you said about skepticism of socialism um, adds to that. I really don't. I don't. Are you coming at this from a particular philosophical or political agenda? The agenda is such a tainted, loaded word, but from a pers- <laughs> from a from a perspective, and it's fine to have a perspective. But I, I think the answer is honestly no, because. Uh... My hope with this show, and honestly, with everything I've, you know, everything I've, I've, everything I wrote even before I started doing the podcast, was not to kind of try to arrive at a conclusion as to whether something was good or bad, or whether someone, you know, was was good or evil, um, but to try to try to harvest the details and the and the plot points that um, make it interesting and that make and that sort of provoke people to. Um, kind of question their assumptions and to uh try to just try to tell just try to tell the best story possible um and i think that i think uh, i'm not saying that you can't tell a story uh you know if you if you if if your if your um priority is to um make a certain make make a specific political point um i think it's certainly possible it's something i'm not very good at doing um but you know that said, it's not like this is a this is some like a purely objective you know without you know a, some purely objective account that lacks perspective. I think you need a point of view. You need to have a, a read on on what you think happened, and you have to have a uh, you know you have to have a perspective. Otherwise, I think it's boring because you know you're just reading or, or hearing a bunch of you know facts that that are uh, that lack any kind of frame. Um, but so I think there's a thin line between having a point of view uh, that is engaging and having a sort of thesis that you are trying to prove. Uh, 
and I try to stay on the on the first half of that line. You need a narrative, but you're not necessarily trying to score political points or something like that. Yeah, or like you're not trying to just you're not trying to. I'm not, I'm not here to try to prove that Clinton was a good president or a bad president. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to convince people that he should have resigned or he shouldn't have resigned. Um, I'm just trying to put as much put 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 the parts of the story out that will um, kind of enrich people's own uh, analysis of those questions. It feels like you've deliberately avoided drawing any parallels with Trump. Um, some of your audience has drawn parallels, particularly with the Nixon season. But I don't feel like you've done that. Have you deliberately avoided that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, when we started the show uh, last year, um, one of the reasons we wanted to do a Watergate podcast is that Watergate kept coming up in the news as a reference point for what was happening uh, with Trump. And so, obviously, you know, that which is to say, like, we, we went into it with... Uh, with the understanding that there might be parallels uh, that would make the make this history relevant to the present, uh, but we did not know how many sort of micro parallels we would discover along the way. Um, how many like plot points would just like feel like exact echoes of stuff that's been happening now? And so we 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 sort of were surprised by how many of those little parallels we found, and uh, we're honestly quite delighted by them in many cases. But we didn't try to. We didn't try to lean into it too hard. We didn't try to um, seek them out or, or emphasize them too much because, honestly, we didn't really need to emphasize them at all. They were just so, so clear. Um, I think the reason not to mention Trump uh, explicitly uh, is not to be coy. I think it's I think it's partly because it would sort of pollute, I think, people's uh, kind of ability to, 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 to process the story on its own terms. But I think the other thing is that... Um, one of the reasons people like the show, I think, is that Trump's not in it. I think people right now have some Trump fatigue. I think they 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 understand that what's happening is really really important and really you know deserves their attention, um, and yet like they're just sick of hearing his name. Uh, and so I think the first season of Slow Burn and possibly the second has, has sort of allowed people to um, you know interpret the news about Trump and interpret his presidency. Um, but to do so without um, without actually sort of being forced to uh, hear his voice or to think about him uh, directly, if that makes sense. Some Democrats have talked about impeaching President Trump. Um, Trump has brought it up himself, I think, to kind of rally his base to his defense. You, having covered Nixon and Clinton, know more about impeachment than almost anyone. Do you have any advice for Democrats who are thinking about impeaching Trump? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I'd frame it as advice, but um, I will say that I, <laughs> I will say that I didn't realize that in the wake of uh, the Clinton, the Lewinsky story coming out in, in January of ninety eight, that that the Republicans were very, for the most part, restrained in terms of talking about impeachment. Like they they made a similar calculation that Democrats seem to be making now, which is that we don't need to be using the I word uh, until it's right, until the time is right. And you know that back in January of ninety eight, that meant waiting for Ken Starr to. Um, to, uh, to 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 deliver his his report and his conclusions, um, and in this case maybe the, you know Mueller's investigation is the is the obvious parallel. Uh, I think what you I think what I what I didn't appreciate uh, as much as I do now uh, is how important it is for an impeachment to be bipartisan. Um, you know, it was something that uh, the people involved in the in the Watergate uh, era impeachment drive understood uh, that if you if you if it's just a party line thing, um, it's going to look partisan and it's going to look illegitimate. Um, in, pr- in practical terms, it, me- it, w- it would mean that you can't actually remove the president in the Senate because in the Senate you need a two thirds majority, which means you need people from both sides of the aisle to sign on. Um, with Clinton, you know, I think Republicans had had a hope that that Democrats would abandon Clinton, um, and that if they did, there would be enough of them, you know, defecting that. They could get that two-thirds majority, or at least sort of gather enough pressure on Clinton that he would just voluntarily step aside. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I guess I suppose maybe it's, it's obvious that that you that you need the other party to to be on board. I think I, I might have been maybe inclined to be more skeptical of that before I learned all this stuff because uh, you can imagine an argument that says, "Well, like if you believe he should be impeached, then you should you should try to impeach him." Um, what what's what what does it matter what anybody what anybody else thinks? But I think the takeaway from these two stories, Clinton and Nixon, is that plowing ahead and 
not worrying about how the other side is thinking about it will leave uh, will leave you with at best a symbolic victory. You know, which which is what I think Republicans got with with the with the impeachment. They impeached Clinton in the House. 